Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer at IT Pro TV. And with me today is one of the engineers on my team and my co-host, Cameron Guerra. Thanks for hey, joining hey. me, Cam. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Always good to have you. So what are we talking about today, Cam? Well, you know, uh, as you know, an organization that uses Haskell in production every day, I figured we should take the chance to um, review this post by Christian at Foxhound Systems, um, where he talks about why Haskell is their first choice for building production software systems and coincides a lot with what we do here at IT Pro TV. So, you know, really going to talk about our experience today and uh, how it relates to some of the really great things that Haskell provides us. Yeah, we, we were joking earlier today that we could have written this blog post like every point. And we're like, yep, yep, we've seen that too. Same stuff. We like that. Yep, mm -hmm, that's great too. The learning curve, kind of tough, but we still love it. Mm hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess we can jump right in. So he broke this down into like nine big points about why he prefers Haskell, and uh, we'll dig into each one of them a little bit. Uh, the first one is maybe the least surprising, which is the strong static type system. I think everybody talks about this when it comes to Haskell, uh, but it's worth remarking like, yeah, it is good. It does help prevent errors and reduce cognitive load. So, so you're telling me Haskell isn't the new JavaScript? Not the <laughs> Wild Wild West anymore? Oh, well, I don't, JavaScript has TypeScript these days, but it's better. <sighs> this, the type system in Haskell is better than the one in TypeScript, I think. Oh, for sure. Hands down, hands down. Yeah, no, I think it was, uh, you know, after the learning curve, which I feel like a lot of people has as a con of learning, ha you know, doing Haskell in production, the cognitive load really does get reduced because you're not thinking about, you know, is this going to work? Is or am I going to get a runtime error here? You're going to see it 95% of the time in the compiler, and the compiler's going to say, "Hey, yeah, that's not the that's not the right thing to do here." You're going to you know, get some type mismatch. Um, yeah, and the most basic example is like, is something null or is it optional or whatever? And this is where, when you compare to languages like Java, you get a huge benefit it by using Haskell because in Java anything can be null uh, but in Haskell only stuff that is marked as maybe can be null yeah there's no if this equal null do this it's there's no having to check that which is yeah super it, super helpful it's amazing to me so like in my history I did a lot of Ruby programming earlier in my career and a huge portion of the like runtime errors that we fixed were nil which is Ruby's null, doesn't, mm. you know, have the method, whatever we wanted to call it, like name or something like that. And it would take forever to track these things down because normally the null came into your system and then it gets passed around by like 15 different functions. And finally something tries to call something on and it's totally disconnected from where it came from. We just don't have those problems in Haskell. We'd never run into that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, in the legacy JavaScript API, we definitely had that experience as well. <laughs> We'd be like, yeah, I'll push this to production. And we wrote test cases and we didn't write the test case in case somebody didn't put anything in. And there you go, runtime exception that's, you know, kind of difficult and dispersed when you're trying to, you know, figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Another great, um, you know, thing that reduces the cognitive load is the fact that types kind of act as a documentation source. Like, I mean, obviously there's <clears throat> implementations where you can use Swagger's documentation to auto-generate auto API documentation and such. But I don't think he's really talking about that here. He's more just talking about you can read a type and he said, oh, the type person, you know, that that's going to be dealing with a person, maybe have a name, maybe have an age, all these different things. And you know, you read the type, you know what it is or what will it'll probably do within the system. Yeah, and there are exceptions to this. So if you have a function that has type, like I take three strings and I give you back a string, good luck figuring out what it actually does. You'll need to read the documentation. But, right, but that's why you have types and type wrappers yeah, around those kind of things. Exactly, and a lot of functions have more specific types than that, so it's still useful. Mm -hmm. And um, another place that this is really useful is searching and like almost getting to the point of program synthesis, having the program write itself where you're like, I don't know what goes here, so I'll put an underscore and have GHC tell me the things that can go in there where all the types will line up. Or you can do these searches on Google or Stackage or wherever, um, but it's really powerful to say like, I know we have a function that does this. I can't remember what it's called right now. Compiler, just tell me what to put in here. 
right? Yeah, no. That those aren't exactly typed holes, right? Those are just holes in general. Isn't type that's typed holes? holes. Things? Type no, holes. that's a, that's a typed hole. Yeah, well, typed holes are yeah. a godsend. Yeah, you know, obviously you have to have probably you know the package in that module if you're expecting it to give you something. But overall, it's been hands down a great tool for you know us as we're working through just day-to-day -day actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, it's been a game changer coming from, again, my previous experience with dynamic languages because you you mentioned you have to have the module in scope, but often you do already because you're dealing with its data types. So you're just like, ah, let's see if there's a conversion function. Oh, there is. All right, cool. I'll use it. And yeah, move on with my bada -bing, bada -bing. life. Yeah. Nice. Speaking of moving well, on with our life, should we go to the next point? I mean, I think so. Yeah. Uh, he talks about how Haskell enables writing code that is composable, testable, and has predictable side effects. Yeah. And this dovetails nicely with what we were just talking about. So as a extension of the powerful type system and the reduced cognitive load, all side effects are typically um, marked as IO or, you know, however you manage effects, we'll just say IO throughout here. But mm -hmm. it it makes it really easy to reason about stuff because when you look at a function, you don't have to wonder, is this reading some environment variable or is it writing to some file or doing something that can change? Um, no, it's just depending exactly on the types that are passed in. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, helps with you know, composability and testability as well. You can kind of, you know, construct what you expect the data to look like, pass it through some functions and, you know, just test the result. Like it's not hard to do in Haskell because it's not always a ton of boilerplate you have to set up. Like if you have your type, you construct it and pass it to a function and see what happens, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that cause it's kind of there, um, which I think is a really great benefit. Yeah. And in addition to the testing side of this, uh, the purity of the predictable side effects makes it easy to do equational reasoning, which is kind of a consequence of, or a different way of stating referential transparency, where if you have some definition, wherever you use that term, you can replace it with its definition and keep doing that until you can kind of see how things are going to work. So uh, typically you'll see examples on blog posts of people doing that with like a fold where they have the fold R expression and then they'll like go one step and go another step and keep doing that until it's all reduced down to one term. Um, mm -hmm. But you can do that to a smaller scale with various functions throughout your code base just to see how they work. And it's pretty powerful. Yeah, for sure. Um, keep on trucking here. Uh, yeah. he, he kind of points at um, how Haskell facilitates rapid development, worry for your factoring, and excellent maintainability. And I think here at IT Pro TV, we are in love with the maintainability we have with our Haskell yes, repo. We would say that it's excellent. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> we, we make an internal joke here that we're all eggs. So it's a very good pun there, Taylor. Yeah, we had a typo three years ago, and it's just puns nonstop since then. Forever and ever. Anyway, yeah, I think that the maintainability of Haskell is one of its biggest selling points. And in fact, after the uh, Haskell survey last year, I wrote a blog post saying that uh, Haskell's killer application is maintainability because mm -hmm. um, it's painless to change stuff. And that makes it really easy to keep iterating on development and just like improving stuff without breaking stuff all the time. Right. Yeah, and I want to point back to, um, you know, the rapid development, you know, there's, he, he references GHCID, which here at IT Pro TV, we use every single day <laughs> as something that allows us to be quick when we're you know, writing day to day code, you know, plugging those type holes in we talked about and mm -hmm. seeing what, what should we plug in there or, you know, oh, this is a compiler, let's keep moving. So, you know, it, there's a lot of, I, th I mean, I think GHCID right now is for me, the top tool we have in our Haskell tool belt uh, for you know rapid development. Yeah, and to give a sense of how rapid it is, um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think our code base is like under 100,000 lines, but roughly around there. And with GHCID, we can build it in, build it and run our test suite in like under five or 10 seconds, depending mm -hmm. on what exactly you change. Um, but yeah, like if you want quick feedback on a typed hole, you can get that within seconds, which is fantastic. Yeah. And you know, another benefit of, you know, the type system in general allows us to have a lot of worry-free 
know, refactoring. Obviously, there's chances that you can create some, you know, a change in a JSON key or something along those lines, which could create runtime errors that you don't catch by the compiler. But 95% of the time, if you're using generics and stuff like that, you're going to be able to you know, keep that pretty maintained as well as having some unit tests and property tests to make sure to go alongside of that to just really ensure that you have a very maintained piece of code and refactoring it yep. kind of gets to be a little easier, a little less stressful. Makes code review a lot nicer too, because you don't have to wonder, does this all still type check? Because you know it does, because the, the build does it for you. Yeah, see, it's like green check mark, good to go. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> awesome, well, um, let's keep going. Yeah, so the next one is talking about performance. Uh, the Haskell programs have stellar performance, uh, leading to faster applications and lower hardware costs. So we've seen this to be true. Um, it's been kind of surprising to me that we're running a lot of our infrastructure on pretty much the smallest Amazon instances that we can, and it just works. Like we haven't really done anything special, no profiling, no like optimized builds or anything like that. I mean, they're optimized, but not especially optimized. Right. Um, and it just works. Um, and again, drawn on my history, I used to work with Ruby applications and we would have uh, maybe scores of them running and you've got like a reverse proxy in front of all of them and they run out of memory all the time and then you have to kill them and restart them and we just don't have to deal with any of that. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think for me, you know, this point was kind of like the, oh, wow, dang, that's cool. Cause it, he did a great comparison with, you know, a scripting language like PHP versus his, you know, the Haskell equivalent, right? They, they mm -hmm. run the same code, they're the same endpoints, same database usage, same payload or, and, or same uh, load uh, of users mm -hmm. and you know he you know the cost is like one sixteenth of what the PHP uh, is you know runs and he's running four services rather you know four instances of the service rather than the two that he was for PHP so like that to me was like whoa like 16 times smaller yeah just I, I think you got the numbers backwards there so they were running four copies of the PHP server because they needed the additional infrastructure and I think they're running two of the Haskell one. Oh no, did I? Oh, I got that backwards. Sorry, I'm bad mm -hmm. at reading tables. You were right. So yeah, they're running smaller services and more of them. Yeah, there and the you know the larger PHP instances had you know four dedicated CPU cores. Yeah, where and they the, had what like sixteen times as much RAM. <laughs> right. Yeah, like have half gig RAM on that you know, instance. Mm -hmm. That's just bonkers that you know they're and they're also outperforming the php instances like by you know you know milliseconds but lot. still yeah it's that's still pretty substantial when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of requests per minute like that's important mm -hmm. yeah he says haskell outperforms php by at least an order of magnitude so i think yeah, that, I mean, we don't have a like for like comparison to make there mm -hmm. from our experience. Like you've mentioned earlier, we do have a legacy JavaScript API that we are migrating away from, but we haven't done any like, okay, let's move this endpoint from here to there and measure the performance along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but like Maybe. I mentioned, all of our Good. services are running on tiny AWS machines and it's working great, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's not necessarily for us a reason to. Right. We'll keep, we have a lot of other projects going on that we can't really <laughs> sit there and tweak the Do the some main, benchmarking, you know, yeah. Yeah, the benchmarking for us isn't as important at the moment now. As you scale, mm -hmm. you want to keep that in mind. But for us, it hasn't really been a concern. But yeah, let's keep, let's keep moving. Uh, we've got the next one, which is Hassle is great for domain modeling and preventing errors in domain logic, um, right? So this is about kind of being able to create data types that clearly express what you're trying to do, um, give you records that make sense, that keep everybody, you know, keep everything in order, it allows you to give data types to these specific fields in the record, and you can really track through it and know, okay, this is, this is what I'm dealing with every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And for me, once I had Haskell's data types, like as a tool in my tool belt, I started to wonder how I ever did anything before because mm -hmm. so often what I want is 
a record of data. So like a, you know, person with a bunch of fields on it and each of those has their own type. And then in addition to that, I want something that lets me select between different things. So like mm -hmm. usually this would be an enum in other languages and enums can't have data associated. But in Haskell, mm -hmm. you can have uh, whatever arbitrary data on there you want. So you can say like your two tools here are I have one thing with a bunch of named fields on it, or I have a choice between all these other things. And mm -hmm. with those two, you can represent basically everything and it feels great to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. A ADTs were a life changer for sure. I mean, I've, even today, I didn't do it in Haskell, but I've been doing a lot in Elm um, mm -hmm. as far as pattern matching is concerned. And I think that was, you know, just incredible that the compiler can catch that as long as you have the warnings enabled, that's, you know, the catch 22 there but you know if yeah, you have warn all or warn error you're going to be able to see if you add something to else to the adt you're going to get you know a compiler that says hey check this out you're missing you know non-exhaustive pattern matching here mm -hmm. and i, I think and that a, a good example of this from the blog post is like if you have something that's modeling an invoice in a more like in javascript you might have a field on the invoice that says is it paid or not? And that thing would be a Boolean and it's true or false. And then as your system grows, you're like, crap, we need to represent uh, this thing can be canceled in addition to either being not paid yet or paid. Um, and so you would either add another field that says canceled and then you have to worry about, well, what if it's paid but, uh, but also canceled? Does that even make sense? Um, and in Haskell, instead, you can have an ADT that says your status is either unpaid, paid, or canceled. And when you go and add that canceled one later, the compiler will tell you, these are the places where you need to go update your code. So this ties back mm -hmm. with that, you know, powerful uh, refactoring and rapid development we were talking about earlier. You just add the constructor and have the con uh, compiler tell you not literally everywhere, but almost everywhere you're gonna go and need to update. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's great. Um, and I, I think it's been game changer for me uh, especially coming from JavaScript previously, where I had to deal with those kind of situations, and I couldn't clearly say, "Hey, I have." Yeah, you can use a case statement, but it's not really the same. You know, mm -hmm. you have to, you're matching on a string or a number, like that's just not how you want to match. Uh, and so, like being able to have these, you know, data types that have this pattern matching is great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we're gonna get into is. Um, you know, as far as Haskell compares to other languages, maybe a little, you know, less, but still just as powerful um, is the amount of libraries, um, high quality libraries that are available where <clears throat> you can look at other languages like JavaScript that has NPM with millions of libraries. Mm -hmm. And you can look at PHP that has all kinds and, you know, like you can look at any language and there's bajillions and Haskell maybe has has a smaller set of that, but everything is high quality. You know what you what you're getting with. Like there's documentation. There's places to search for, through it, comprehend what's going on. Um, you know, yes, you're not going to get a third party service to you know have some SDK for Haskell. That's most likely not going to happen. But mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you can't write it and put it out there for the world. You know, yeah. it, it it's a great great place to got some good stuff. Yeah, and I, again, was surprised. So coming from Ruby, which has many times more packages available than ha uh, Haskell, for pretty much everything we do at work, there is a package already available. And like you mentioned, for third-party services, there may not be one, but it turns out that having, a, having the ability to define those custom types that we just talked about makes it really easy to write your own because you say, okay, this is the data model that I'm gonna be sending to them, and this is what I expect back. And then you just plug an HTTP library, typically, in between those, and you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for us, you know, we, we use Recurly, and we've kind of created our own Recurly library. Uh, I don't know if we've published it anywhere at the moment, but, you know, we not yet. We have some set of, you know, we know the specifications, we've seen their documentation, and we wrote out, you know, specs that can, you know, be translated, you know, the data types are all written and all that kind of stuff, and it's just kind of there. Um, you know, we don't really have yeah. a ton of time to maintain an open source library like that, but you know, it's possible. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, moving on to the next one, uh, 
Haskell makes it easy to write concurrent programs. Um, basically, Haskell's runtime lets you have multiple green threads going at the same time. So unlike JavaScript, where everything is single threaded, with Haskell, you can have multiple threads. And this makes doing anything with asynchronous stuff way nicer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I personally, like in my professional experience, I haven't had too much issue with async and not async. Um, but I know yeah, you have with, with your Ruby situation. Yeah. So as I keep mentioning, I used to work a lot with Ruby. And um, the only option there, if you wanted to do something asynchronously, was to throw it on a job queue. Because otherwise, you would uh, hold up the thread that was serving the request, and you wouldn't be able to serve the next request. So if you wanted to like send an email to somebody, or when somebody logs in, you want to go like update something in your database, but it's not critical that it gets done before they finish logging in. So you, can, you want to do it in the background. You would have to make a job for that. Whereas in Haskell, you can just say async, whatever, and it'll go do it. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's great. So woo, go concurrent woo. programs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's keep moving. Uh, we've got, I've got a my dog here who keeps butting into the table so i par pardon me if you keep hearing random crashes um <laughs> that would be a little puppy being a little puppy um anyways keep keep moving we've got uh, haskell enables domain specific languages which foster expressiveness and reduce boilerplate yeah um, elaborate <laughs> sure so i think these days the canonical example of a domain specific language well, maybe, maybe not. It, SQL is one. So uh, if you want to interact with a relational database, more likely than not, you're going to be writing SQL. And Haskell makes it really easy to use languages like SQL inside of a Haskell program so that you can um, write your query using languages that you know already. Mm -hmm. And usually the way this is done is with template Haskell. And one of the examples that he calls out is persistent. And this is used to like define your data models and how they get stored to the database and how you query them. Um, and it comes with a whole slew of benefits. Um, but for me, I am not the world's biggest fan of DSLs. I like them okay, but um, I am I like embedded domain specific languages a little bit more. And an eDSL is something that uses the syntax of the like quote unquote host language. So instead of like having a embedded SQL string in your code, you would write like a Haskell expression that then gets turned into SQL. So for other languages, usually this is a like ORM, an object relational manager library, whatever it is, mm -hmm. where you like, you know, do user dot find, you know, some ID, whatever. And it just creates the SQL for you behind the scenes. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't have a ton of experience with DSLs, I'm sure. You know, with time I will, um, but I'm definitely looking to kind of understand like, you know, our, the example he gives here, persistent, like we're using it more and more, you know, for SQL and for Mongo. So understanding a little bit more about how those work um, is going to be really beneficial. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, I think the last one is my favorite personally. Uh, you know, I feel like I've probably said these are my favorite, like all of them, but this one's <laughs> my favorite because it's true. Um, and you know, Haskell Weekly gets a shout out. Uh, well, <laughs> but you said it's true. The The topic here is that it has a large community filled with smart and friendly people. And yeah, I, I agree with this one. Um, you know, as part of running Haskell Weekly, I keep an eye on lots of different parts of the community and, uh, you know, by and large, it's really smart and friendly. If you have a question, people are very happy to help you with it and show you um, how to do things the right way. Yeah, I think that's awesome. You can get a little puppy love over here too. <laughs> runs around and it's getting really feisty right now. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that about wraps up the post. And, and like we said at the top, you know, we, I guess, feel basically the same as these guys at Foxhound Systems that um, Haskell has enabled us to write very um, robust, reliable software and maintain it over time without, you know, ripping our hair out, trying to debug null pointer, null, null pointer exceptions and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, 
uh, like the last one mentioned, the community is super important and we're happy to be a part of that. Uh, if you want to, you know, figure out what's going on in the community, please uh, go check out the Haskell Weekly newsletter. You can read more at haskellweekly.news. You can catch us on Twitter, on Reddit, GitHub, all over the place. Um, but yeah. 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 And Haskell Weekly is brought to you by our employers, IT Pro TV, which is the e-learning platform for IT professionals. Uh, we just wanted to you know, thank you all for listening. Um, and IIT Pro TV would love to extend a promo code to you guys. That is Haskell Weekly 30 uh, for 30% off the lifetime of your membership. Um, so please, if you're interested, go check out itpro.tv. Um, get your access. You can sign up for a free account if you want. Um, but yeah, if you got any interest in IT, please, please, please check it out. For sure. Well, thanks so much for listening. See you next time. Peace.